So thank you for joining us today. Uh, this is GitOps Core Concepts and How to Teach Your Teams with Lee Kapili, who is a developer experience engineer here at Weaveworks. I'm Stacy Potter, a community manager also at Weaveworks. And um, yeah, this is just another of a mini series that Lee has been doing, th thankfully, um, for our Flux community. So if you are a member, thank you. I'm just gonna run through some intro slides here and then we can get started. So if you've joined us in the past, like I said, you know that we've been doing these about every two weeks. Um, so thanks to Lee. And again, if you're a member of our community in Flux, we really appreciate that, that you're here and that you're part of that community. Uh, hopefully you also know that the team has been really heads down working hard on the new revamp of Flux V2. So a lot of these talks have focused on giving you more of a sneak peek um, into the powerful capabilities that we've been able to offer with the new Flux version two. So we've still got a lot more work to do and we'll continue to host these and we absolutely welcome your feedback. So please let us know what you think and if there is you know, a particular topic or guide or something that you want us to poke into a little bit more. Um, we're more than happy to, to do that on these and would love that feedback. Uh, so if you're new to these talks, we'll give you a quick little brief intro on uh, what is GitOps, so if you're new to the space, uh, in just a second. So thanks again for joining us. And a little bit about where Lee and I work at Weaveworks. Um, so hopefully if you know us, you know us from so much of the work that we've done from open source. So of course, we'll be looking at Flux today, which is in the CNCF as a sandbox project at the moment. Uh, the team is close to getting this into incubation, thanks to everyone involved in that effort. Uh, Flagger is also now under the Flux umbrella. That is, a, you know, many, many people know that that's another open source project from our teammate Stefan Prodon uh, that is centered around progressive delivery, such as canary deployments. Um, and Lee has a couple of videos ago now walked in, done, done the, um, the GitOps hands-on exercise. So if you haven't seen that, please go back and check that out. It's really great. Um, that was really fun. Yeah, with Flux and Flagger. So um, if you're interested in that, that's posted on our YouTube channel. Um, and we've got you know lots of other stuff. Uh, Cortex is a project that is built, uh, built upon and improves uh, upon Prometheus. Uh, Weave Ignite is a project created by Lucas Kallstrom, another teammate of ours who's here uh, on the DX team, and uh, lots more that are not even listed on this page. So you can check those out on our GitHub page or go to our website. So a very quick uh, housekeeping item. I think everyone in the world is used to using Zoom now, so I'm not going to dive too much into this. Uh, but the one thing that I will note is if you have a question at any time, feel free to put it into the chat box. We don't really use the Q&A panel or um, chat. So if you just use the regular chat box, uh, we'll be looking for questions there. Um, when you do address or, or enter a question in, if you could just change the two uh, to all panelists and attendees so that everyone in the audience can see it, um, we have a lot of people on this call that are usually part of the community and who have a lot of knowledge already and help to answer questions oftentimes. Um, so unless you have something super private, um, please make sure to change that to to all panelists and attendees. So as I said, a quick little intro of what is GitOps if you're brand new and, uh, you know, don't know a lot about GitOps. This is a quick, quick little intro. So as the name Git indicates, uh, it's Git plus ops, or sometimes we like to say operations by pull request, where you have a repo as your single source of truth. It's not just app dev or just operations, but really a methodology that crosses all areas. We talk about GitOpsing all the things and the business value that comes with that are reliability, velocity, and security benefits. It's also a paradigm or a methodology. It's not one single tool or technology. Uh, of course, we're very excited about our Flux project and we work really hard to get it to the place where we've already brought GitOps value. Um, 
but we're thinking about the vision uh, of the most powerful way that we can think about GetOps in the coming years and hopefully decades. And we really do feel that even if you're not using Kubernetes, you can still do GitOps. But if you are using Kubernetes, it really is part of the evolution of Kubernetes, leveraging that Kubernetes API and what that brings. And really it's the next stage and way of leveraging the benefits of that technology. And we're really excited to be a part of that community uh, in a very deep way. So check out our YouTube channel. Uh, it's Weaveworks. Uh, you can just search YouTube for Weaveworks or youtube.com slash, I think there's C for channel slash Weaveworks Inc. Um, for some great talks there from our previous GitOps Days events, uh, there's actually two playlists that you can find that are public. One is from the Americas event that was in May, and then the other November event, which was uh, for the EMEA time zone. So there's a lot of good information there. So you could check out. So the four principles of GitOps, I'll run through these quickly. Not everybody has these four principles. So really anywhere you start is a great way to start your, get started on your journey. Um, whether you're using Git as your versioning system or not, the important thing is that you're using a versioning system. Other core principles are that you have a declarative system and that you have a way which changes are automatically applied to that system. And then at the end, uh, you have ways of having reconciliation and ensuring you have correctness and alerts with that. Uh, so that's a very bare bones overview of the principles. And if you're interested in learning more, as I mentioned before, please do check out those talks and playlists on our GetOps Days events uh, that are on our YouTube channel. So with that, I will hand it over to Lee and stop sharing. Yeah, thanks so much, Stacey. That's actually, it's a really great overview of the value and kind of the core of what GitOps is. And so, you know, we never want to be kind of like taking ownership over the way that the community does things. Uh, just a huge recognition to a lot of you who've actually joined the call, been in the Flux community for quite a long time. If you're new here, welcome. Uh, we actually really want to hear your ideas and the way that you do things. Uh, and so uh, super excited for you to join us. And um, yeah, GitOps is not any one method or one tool set, but we do have methodology and um, using these tools with our teams uh, helps us solve social and technical problems. The kind of combination of those two being, you know, this like buzzword of like socio technical problems and solutions uh, that we got from the DevOps community in the DevOps space. Um, so lots of really great theory happening um, with GitOps that really move the way that we build platforms uh, and work with each other. Go check out the GitOps Days content. Uh, also, this talk will be recorded. Uh, I know that folks always ask about slides and that kind of thing. Just check out our YouTube. We post them there. Uh, lots of stuff already in this series if you're looking for more intro and very advanced content. Uh, we try to do a mixture of those. Uh, and we've got another one of these talks coming up in February. I'm gonna share my screen. Just, we're gonna talk through some docs today and really get at the core concepts of what makes Flux really special and how it can help you uh, build really powerful working relationships with the people on your team, uh, or even just serve you value if you're an individual who's trying to do things properly in an organized way with Kubernetes. Uh, so, we uh, have an awesome contributor who joined our team. Uh, their name is Sumtochi. And Sumtochi contributed a getting started guide. Um, and you can go through this and get started with installing all of the binaries and that kind of thing. It takes you kind of through a workflow if you are somebody who really likes to do things, get your hands on it, and feel what it's like to actually use something you learn through doing, right? So really great way uh, to kind of uh, get familiar with Flux. Uh, go through the Getting Started Guide. You can see it's not super long. I'd say you could probably get through this if you were unfamiliar and didn't even have any of the binaries or brew installed or anything like that uh, in probably 15 to 25 minutes. Uh, if it takes you longer, no worries. You know, we'll move at our own pace. Now, the Getting Started Guide is great, um, but we have more docs than just that. And if you go here to the sidebar right at the top level, 
under under intro and between getting started, there's the core concepts page. And some Tochi also contributed this. Uh, we're going to be iterating on the core concepts page to help make this more of a place where you can reference how things are supposed to work together. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry, just reading some of your comments to make sure I'm not missing any of you. Cool. Yeah, we will definitely get to some of these questions. Uh, super stoked to have a little bit of conversation on that. Uh, so we talked about GitOps, right? We want a tool set that helps us do things in a declarative, reconciling way. Uh, we're probably using Kubernetes in this day and age. Uh, lots of us moving to cloud native technologies. So Flux is a really great tool set for you to uh, build your own way of doing GitOps with good patterns that the tool will help you adopt. Uh, and so the there's some key separations of concerns that we have in Flux 2 that are exciting and powerful. And one is the separation of sources from the application of manifests, uh, as well as a description of how reconciliation plays into everything. And so we have this separate idea of sources. If you have a declaration, it could come from Git, but it could also come from other places like a Helm chart repository uh, or a bucket that you say you want to push a bunch of release manifests to from your generated CI pipeline. So the sources are all represented by objects inside of the Kubernetes cluster. And they are what allow us to tell Flux to constantly make sure that it fetches and has an up-to-date version of the specific version of thing that we want to clone into the cluster, whether that be a Git repository, a Helm repository, or Helm chart, uh, or a bunch of manifests from some bucket. Uh, this is also where we would extend sources to other things that we're working on currently in the Kubernetes community right now. And this allows us to say, hey, I want to sync a particular path of, or I want to sync a particular Git repository and make sure that the stage tag is always cloned to my cluster. And since we have an object inside of the Kubernetes cluster that represents that source, and if you were to say, look at the source controllers documentation and look at the source controllers API, this is where you would get status messages. So for instance, if I were to say, uh, use the flux command line tool uh, to get a number of sources, I can pick, am I interested in Git? And then it lists me which Git repositories I have in the cluster as well as whether they are, um, whether they're fetched, whether that source is actually ready to be used, uh, whether it's being served from source controller inside the cluster, what revision it's at, uh, and uh, if it's suspended. Sorry, the printer hey, is- I'm sorry, could you um, it just, yeah, zoom in, thanks. That's is that great. a little bit better? Thanks, Perfect. that's a good note there. <laughs> Right. So we can work with sources. Now I'm using the flux command line tool here uh, because it's just got some UX niceties, but usually I actually use the kubectl command line tool. So in the flux system namespace, so it's kubectl get namespace flux system, uh, I can be interested in the git repositories that are in that namespace. I just tap completed that, but that's git repositories. And that gives me more or less the same exact output. You can see when it was applied to the cluster. Uh, there's no additional printer field here for suspended. Uh, I think even when you output it as wide, it doesn't do that. Yeah. So you can see a little bit of the just UX differences that we get when we use the printers from the Flux command line tool instead. Okay. So basic concept here, right? We can use a source type object. Source controller will fetch that thing into the cluster and post status about it to the object that represents it. Um, if that's maybe not so clear, uh, instead of outputting it as a text field, we can output it as the YAML that it takes to actually get that thing into the cluster. Uh, this is really ugly because of all of the uh, extra metadata that's included for server-side apply. But if you actually look at the spec here, it's pretty short. 
So here um, we can specify what Git implementation was used to clone to the cluster, uh, what secret is being used, uh, what branch we wanted to clone over what interval, that kind of thing. Here's the URL of my GitHub Git repository. So good stuff, separation of concerns. But just because the repo is cloned into the cluster, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that we want to apply anything from that repo consistently to the cluster. Uh, so that's the second half of the equation. Uh, if you want to consider what a customization is for a second, uh, the name for this is actually a little bit unfortunately chosen. We have an issue about potentially renaming this, uh, but this is a customization apply. Uh, so we would take some path in the repository and then, or so, some path inside of the source, it doesn't have to be a Git repo, and then continuously apply that to the cluster. So now that we've separated these things, there's no confusion about what state is Flux reconciling. Right. We know that the source is cloned into the cluster at this particular revision. There's no issues with talking to Git. Uh, if there are errors, they pop up when we look at the source using, you know, flux get sources. Right. So if I if there was an issue here, I would see that error um, on this object. But now that we know that our source is cloned in, it's ready to go. Uh, then we can use customize controller and customization objects to apply particular parts of that source to the cluster with health checks and dependencies and all of this kind of state management that you wanna to do to get everything to roll out properly. Uh, and so the customized controller has docs very similar to the source controller. If you look under toolkit components, go to sort of customize controller. Here's the overview on how things work. Uh, here's kind of what those features and responsibilities are for the controller. Uh, I mentioned things uh, like the health checks that should be here on this list, uh, reporting cluster changes, pruning objects. Like when you remove something from a particular path, it is the customized controller's responsibility to also remove it from the cluster if you want that to happen. There's an option to configure that inside of the customization spec. Uh, there's the dependency management, the health checks. Uh, here we can also impersonate service accounts to start moving towards multi-tenancy and that kind of thing. Uh, we're working more on making this story mature, but it's already very usable. And Stefan's got some great examples that I could point you to if you're interested in multi-tenancy. Uh, lots of questions about repo structure inside of the chat. Uh, we also get tons of questions in our uh, Slack channel. There's also a GitHub discussion, I think, about repo structure now. And um, really having a good concept of the separation of sources and then the ability to use customizations to apply specific paths of a Git repository or other source uh, is a key idea that allows you to split up your repository and create the structure that folks are talking about with multiple environments or teams or even separate stages of deployment with dependencies and that kind of thing. Uh, I'll show you what I mean. So I have a repository that I've been working on with somebody from uh, uh, Dan Papandra. He's the, he runs the podcast. We're working on a Flux Falco uh, collab. And there is an element of the demo we are playing with for using Kubeless, uh, which is a serverless technology on Kubernetes. And when we first configure Flux to sync to the repository, we have our normal GOTK sync YAML inside of the Flux system namespace. This is probably a little small for you folks. Here we go. Better. So I have a Git repo with my config directory, and this has the source. It's a Git repository hooked up to my GitHub repo right here. And then I also have a matching customization that applies this particular path in the repo to the cluster at least every 10 minutes or whenever there's a change. 
Right. So this customization applies this path from this source reference. It's hooked up to this Git repo and make sure that whenever this repo updates, uh, that eventually those things get applied, uh, whether it's from a push-based event or just from the reconcile loops. Uh, you can see we can configure validation, all kinds of good stuff there. So this is great for when we just want to sync a bunch of manifests from a folder. Here we can see, oh, okay, well, when we run the repo sync, everything under this entire directory, clusters bakery zero, gets synced to the cluster. But then in the kubeless directory, we have these two different YAML files that also mention the word sync in their name. Uh, and that's just me naming them so that I can find them easily. Right? We see that we've created a kubeless namespace, and then we can sync the kubeless manifests. This is also a customization. But it references a the same repository, source ref. It's uh, the flux system repo that we hooked up with from the previous manifest we we're looking at. So it's referencing that same source, but it's syncing a different path. And Flux doesn't force you to have your repo structured in any particular way. But what we have done is we've tried to provide a lot of very good examples for you to become inspired on the best way for you to lay out your manifests in your repo. Uh, Brian says, will customize work if we have remote bases? The answer is yes, it does work. Um, but you have to make sure that authentication uh, is settled there. Um, what I like to do is have a library directory inside of my repo uh, where I put my other customized bases to compose things. Uh, but it does it does function if you have your authentication set up or if you're using public repositories uh, for your custom spaces. Um, that is a very powerful way to compose multiple Git repositories together. Um, Steve, it's kind of a, an advanced question about customized setters. The answer is I don't know off the top of my head. Um, that's a great question, though. Uh, I imagine that anything that you uh, put inside of your customization YAML uh, will function properly. But the way that we invoke customize is slightly library dependent. Uh, so if anything depends on changing the execution environment uh, where the customization is being inflated inside the controller, uh, you would probably need to uh, modify the customized controller um, root of S or that container image that runs that. So if you need extra binaries or things like that uh, running inside of customized controller, uh, we don't have any clear story in the documentation for that right now, but it's probably workable. Um, but if, if all you need is just to modify your customization YAML to get things to work, um, then all of those features are supported. Uh, nothing special has to happen in the Flux specific customization kind. This is a point of confusion that I'm glad uh, we can talk about. Uh, this is not the same as the customization that's used to inflate your manifest. So you would have a separate one for that, that has all of the options to actually enable the, the patching and the image updates and that kind of thing. Um, cool. Anyway, uh, back to the applying a different path. So you can reference a different path from the same repo, apply it on a more aggressive interval, um, change the validation options or prune options if you want to for this particular path inside of the lib directory. You can also then say that that thing is only healthy once this health check passes. And customize controller, uh, this is a case status compliant uh, health check. And so you can, um, you can point this at any object inside of your repo that you're applying to the cluster or inside of your source. And um, it can go check on that thing and, and it won't mark the customization as ready until that thing is ready. The reason why that's important is because at the same time, I can apply another customization that syncs another path, right? So one of these just installs kubeless from my lib directory, but the second one actually runs all of my user defined functions. And I can only do that once 
the custom resource definition for functions is deployed into the cluster. It changes the way that the Kubernetes API server works altogether. And so we can then reference our same exact source. Notice I could also reference a different source here. Right? I could have multiple repos. We don't force you to use only one. We don't use, force you to use only one path. Uh, we don't force you to use a single ref inside of your repository. So you can lay things out whichever way makes sense for your organization. And I'm happy to talk about patterns that would make you successful, uh, having been through this several times uh, over the past couple of years as GitOps has evolved. Now, this depends on a feature. Um, yeah, Steve. Oh, by the way, Steve, I think your thing is set to all panelists. Uh, but if you change that to all panelists and attendees, people will be able to pick up on your uh, revelations and comments. Uh, but yeah, Steve just mentioned that it depends on feature. That's a great idea because it allows us to, in a single reconcile, right? So we apply all of these manifests to the cluster at one time. And then things like custom resource definitions or network policies or other types of RBAC, um, if you want to get namespaces configured a certain way before workloads actually deploy into them, these kinds of ordering issues when you bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster for the very first time, uh, they can be easily solved with Flux's dependency management and health check features. And this allows us to then say, I don't want to sync my functions customization into the cluster before the kubeless installation is there. This is also one of the big reasons why it's important that sources and these apply type reconciliation objects like customization and Helm release are separated from each other because we can sync the cluster in uh, or we can sync the sources into the cluster and then apply different parts of it at different times. Very clever. So um, you can see with just a single repo structure, we could all have this in a single commit if we wanted. We can lay out a dependency tree, make sure that it follows the health checks so that none of our rules are violated and we don't have any validation issues with missing APIs from custom resource definitions and things like that. Uh, definitely a little bit of a sore spot right now in the um, Kubernetes community with like maintaining clusters. And so we're so happy that we've been able to collab with the community through Flux One and the developments in Flux Two to build something that is generically useful. Uh, and powerful and grows with you. So um, that's a key idea there, separating sources uh, and customizations. Uh, I also mentioned that there are there's the ability to work with Helm inside of Flux. Uh, Helm is a super important project to the ecosystem. And so in addition to the sources, as well as the customized controller kind of allowing us to apply both basic plain manifest directories, as well as customized directories with remote bases and patches and all of that. Uh, maybe I didn't make that clear enough. You can use customized controller to simply apply a directory of manifests. Um, and even more powerful is you could, you could generate that directory with other tools like JK, CDKs, JSONet, uh, and other things. It doesn't have to be YAML either, it could be JSON. So. A customized controller is how you get objects to the cluster. Now, say you want to install uh, an instance of the Helm chart. We have a Helm release. And similarly, the source controller supports hooking up to Helm repositories. Uh, so when you use these APIs together, uh, you can get Flux to declaratively maintain a bunch of Helm releases in your cluster, which if you've ever used Helm in production, uh, the imperative nature of doing a Helm install and Helm upgrade with Helm with rollbacks and things like that can sometimes be a little bit frustrating. Uh, and so being able to convert that into a versioned declarative flow instead of depending on you know, uh, various people on teams to interact with the cluster in an imperative manner using the Helm command line tool. Uh, you can still interact with the cluster. So say here I'm doing a Helm list of everything in all namespaces. You can see I've used Helm charts to install two of the projects from the Falco security organization, uh, Falco and Falco Sidekick. 
but I didn't use Helm install or upgrade to get these things into the cluster. What I did was I hooked up to the Falco security Helm repository. So no longer dependent on managing Helm repos on my local machine, we can actually ask Helm controller to do that. Inside of the Falco directory, and this repo's up on GitHub, uh, it's stealthybox slash Falco hyphen flux. There is a Helm YAML, and I've got three objects in here. They are the Helm releases, which actually do the apply action or the installation of a chart. Uh, those Helm releases have a chart template inside of them, as well as values for specific customizations of things I want. Uh, or specific behavior. I want to configure the chart with different values before I release it. And then there's the source. So we actually want to hook up to the Helm repository, make sure that we download that index and make it uh, available in the cluster. And then when we create a Helm release, then a Helm chart will also be synced to the cluster uh, in, to make sure that we match up with that release. And then we can apply all of the things using the Helm libraries. Uh, from inside of Helm controller. Uh, also, Helm 3 doesn't actually encourage you to create namespaces, so we have the perfect place uh, inside of our GitOps bootstrap repo to actually create the namespace that we want to release uh, those charts into. So really great way of declaratively managing all of the different moving parts and pieces of, uh, of using Helm inside a cluster uh, without getting into who did what and losing the state and managing repos on laptops and things like that. Uh, Helm controller with the Flux APIs allows you to have a clean separation and, and explicit declaration of everything that you're looking to accomplish, including uh, right here, I've just pinned these versions, but you can even have a SEMVAR range here. Uh, so you could say, like, instead of just doing 0.2.2 of Falco Sidekick, you could say, ah, I want actually just anything in the O2 series, you know. And when the Helm repository updates, Flux will actually just release that for you. So that's a form of uh, automation there that uh, Flux allows you to do. You can get out of the concern of uh, keeping up with stable releases or, or point releases for the project that you're tracking. So. And um, can I see the release logs? Cool. So two great questions coming in. Uh, actually, several great questions. One is, uh, when a Flux customization is applied, is it the pure customized build command which is launched? And how is the customized version configured? Uh, the customized version that's used is whatever is shipped with that version of customized controller. Uh, so it's kept very up to date. Uh, and uh, hopefully client side, if you were you know, a developer that was working on customizations, uh, then you would be uh, using an up to date version of customize that you know, is within the version scheme you're looking for. Uh, hopefully you'd use a package manager to stay up to date there. And um, you can actually manage your Flux installation directly from this Flux system directory. So uh, when you use a bootstrap repo, then um, the GOTK sync YAML controls how everything is synchronized to the cluster. And the components YAML has all of the, um, the APIs, the namespace, the controller deployments uh, that actually are responsible for installing Flux, all that is committed to your repo here. So you can, uh, for instance, update Flux uh, by just running the bootstrap command again for the newer version of the Flux CLI. It will update your repo, update this components thing. You'll have a git commit that has the differences, and you'll see that new version of customized controller and source controller rolling out uh, with that update to customize and any other things that you're looking for inside a Flux system to be managed and up to date. Um, great question there. Uh, hopefully I helped you with the mental model there and addressed the question a little bit. Uh, Neha Gupta says, how can I see release logs? Uh, this one is really cool. So I could try to mess something up here really quick. 
Um, but if you were to say be interested in the, let's describe the customization inside of all namespaces. So when you actually um, open up the events for a particular customization, whatever is most up to date for what's being applied there uh, will, whether things were removed uh, or created or updated, each object that's affected by that particular customization, uh, whether there's a validation issue or if it's been applied correctly, will show up in the event log for that particular object. So there's no sifting around through particular controller logs necessarily to be concerned with how to get that information. Now that info is also available in the controller logs. So if you have like a Kibana dashboard uh, and you are uh, filtering based off of logs, all of the controller logs are structured. Uh, and so you can say like, uh, for a particular namespace, you know, split up each customization into, you know, something inside of Kibana uh, or another log reading solution. Uh, we are also talking about adding that to the Flux CLI as well, so that if you want to debug the controller's reconciliation, uh, there's an easy way to do that. Uh, but the, um, the event log here for a particular resource, whether that is a source, a Helm release, a customization, it's always super helpful for identifying what the actual problem is, whether it's authentication, uh, if a GPG key wasn't set up correctly, if an SSH key has been revoked, you'd be able to see that kind of stuff based off of the errors inside of the events. Uh, all of the controllers are also instrumented via Prometheus, so you can set up Prometheus alert monitoring rules and things like that if you use that part of the cloud native stack. Um, now, uh, Giris Gudar says, uh, can we create the secrets using Flux? I haven't gotten to this part yet in terms of core concepts, uh, but if you scroll down a little bit, there's a little note about bootstrapping. Uh, and this is the process of actually getting Flux installed into your Kubernetes cluster, uh, either creating or hooking up to an existing Git repo, uh, doing the crypto to create SSH keys, installing the SSH key into the Git repo hosting provider, whether that's GitHub, GitLab, or Bitbucket, or whatever. Um, that whole process can kind of be a little bit of a juggle, and um, it's a bit challenging for folks, especially uh, from when we were with Flux 1. We did a lot of work to try and solve this problem, and with Flux 2, we have a simple bootstrap command. So I just set up this... Um, repo uh, the other day. And the cluster that I'm working on is brand new from like 30 minutes ago. It's just a kind cluster. I did a kind create cluster, uh, that's all. And then the next thing I did was I exported my GitHub user and my credentials. Um, I just used my hub token with some expanded permissions. And then after that, I just did flux bootstrap. So I ran this command, and it's item potent, so I'm not worried about running it again. Um, and it just makes sure that the components are installed in the cluster, uh, that the manifests are actually committed to the repo. It clones the repo for you, pushes it up. It generates an SSH key, it installs the SSH key for you. So um, that's one part of the secrets creation. The other part is, uh, can we actually manage secrets inside of our Git repo? And we have a guide for that. Uh, as well as several approaches. Uh, the most recommended one that I would say after a lot of experimentation um, is if you go to guides, you can, uh, there's one for sealed secrets, although I would really recommend using SOPs. Um, so Flux has an integration with SOPs. Uh, you can also use any other secrets controller, uh, but SOPs is a great project that allows you to use uh, your cloud's KMS providers, you could use GPG keys, you could, um, you know, just somebody else was opening up another issue about uh, an integration with a secrets management solution called Age, uh, and SOPS has support for Age now, so that stuff is already kind of inherited from Flux's support of SOPS. Um, go ahead and check this out if you want to be using uh, asymmetric encryption inside of your Git repository. Uh, you can give a public key uh, out to all of your developers or use your cloud account uh, along with you know your cloud's KMS solution or, or maybe you want to use uh, 
like your own uh, vault, you know, backend with SOPs. Uh, and then people can, you know, create secrets in that manner and then check them directly into the repository uh, in a safe way that doesn't expose those secrets. The only thing that would be able to decrypt those secrets are anybody who has access to the uh, signing key uh, or the cluster where that signing key is stored. Uh, something you'd want to back up for sure as well, so that if you lose your cluster, you don't lose your uh, keys to your secrets. Uh, but if that did happen, we are doing GitOps, so you would just be able to recreate them if you needed to. Um, so good question about secrets. And let's see. Um, Lorenzo is asking about Helm controller with regard to Helm releases. Um, So I didn't fully uh, show this yet, but uh, I showed you the manifests and here are the Helm release objects living inside the cluster. Uh, Helm release does have a depends, a depends on field. Uh, so you can do that. But what you can also do, and I would almost recommend this more, uh, is if you want to install Helm charts that depend on each other, um, not the actual Helm chart dependency section, but like when you want to install phases of infrastructure, say you have a Helm chart for policies um, and then a Helm chart for namespaces. And then you had a Helm chart for several apps that you know have some deployment order. You can use customizations to apply different parts of your repository and those folders in your repo uh, or in different repos can have customizations that then have Helm releases inside of them. Uh, so if I didn't want Falco to deploy on the first bootstrap of the cluster, I could move this directory out to the root of the repo and I could add a customization here that then only syncs that after say Kubeless is deployed or after my functions are deployed. Okay. So I can use th this Falco directory has my Helm release declaration. This is the intent to release the chart. I don't have to apply this at any particular time. I can choose using a customization with health checks and dependencies to have any set of criteria to roll that out uh, in a multi-phase deployment. Uh, hopefully that makes sense, Lorenzo. Um, we have examples of this. Uh, if you actually look at our, it's from, I think, a month and a half, or a month ago, we did a uh, Flagger and Flux2 on EKS app mesh. Um, we, we recorded a series of that and went through the whole demo. Uh, and it includes Flagger, it includes app mesh, and it involves installing a bunch of Helm charts, which actually depend on each other. And uh, exactly what I'm talking about, we use customizations to phase it out uh, and do particular health checks based off of resources that we're expecting inside of those Helm charts to come up uh, before we gate to the next deployment. This is not something that you could do with Helm natively, but um, because the Flux APIs are so generically powerful, you're able to do that kind of thing. Um, let's see. I do see that you're mentioning about dependencies for charts being fetched uh, from different repositories. And I'm not sure about cross repo dependencies. That would be really interesting. I think the repos have to actually be declared inside of the uh, chart YAML or the, I forget if the chart YAML is where that is now. There might be a dependencies file inside the chart uh, with Helm version three. But yeah, those things are fetched. Um, and whether those dependencies are local or from a repo, uh, when the chart's actually cloned by source controller, that is managed by that. Sorry, I didn't read your full question and I went on a little bit of a tangent. So there's two parts of that. You can do dependencies uh, between the rollout of when you want things to be installed using the depends on feature um, with either Helm releases or customizations. Uh, and you, the part that you're talking about, it's handled inside of source controller already for chart, chart dependencies. So that is how that works. Um, and then Andreas asked a great question, which is, uh, would you really consider Semver notation for charts in production? Uh, and uh, he mentions 
probably the approach that deep take was just updating the helm releases in an automated way um and that would totally work yeah you could do that um might be fine for dev though. Yeah, I mean, it just depends on your release process. So, you know, when we were talking about GitOps uh, at the very start of this talk, you know, when Stacy was going through uh, how it's really not a prescription for a technical solution, uh, it really depends on how your organization works. And release workflow is one of the most social and sticky problems I think that we have the privilege of trying to solve as platform owners or DevOps people, or just you know one of the more senior engineers on the team uh, of developers who's trying to get releases out quickly, but also with good quality. Uh, and so what is the criteria for when your artifact becomes tagged and when it becomes ready? Uh, and I have a great example to kind of illustrate how Flux can help you solve this social technical problem. Um, if we go, uh, if you watch GitOps, the, the power of GitOps part three, um, it's a little bit of a sketchy demo, but I've gotten a lot of feedback that this was helpful for folks. Uh, the power of GitOps part three, I go through this demo repo uh, for which I have regrettably not posted a more um, informative readme. But you can see uh, that in this repo, there is a main branch like normal, but there are also tags and there in the config directories, there are places for us to have development specific customizations to config as well as stage specific customizations to config. Uh, you can also pop out and see that we have a separate area for a production cluster with a production environment and production specific customizations, all separate things. Um, so that's what those folders represent. But we also, in addition, if you look at the commit log, you can see that main is ahead of the dev tag, which is ahead of the stage tag. So you can have automation or you can have someone here coming in manually to tag uh, specific folders, or sorry, to tag your repo at a specific time. And then the content of that repo also allows you to have the separate folders. So you can bundle related changes that are meant to go across multiple different environments into the same commit. But just because you commit those things at the same time doesn't mean necessarily that you have to release them at the same time. And since Flux can point to sources uh, with different tags, you can create multiple sources that point to the same repo at a different reference. Then you can release different folders at different tags and then have a rollout of changes from different times. So dev can be newer than stage, which can be newer than production. And um, you never lose the fact that you were working on a particular idea at any one time. And I find that this kind of workflow is very powerful. It's helped GitOps really click for people in their release workflow, um, instead of like trying to manage changes and not include them in the repo until they were ready to deploy. Uh, so uh, go ahead and uh, if you're more interested in kind of release workflow, how to decide um, working with your team, when to release things, how to stage them, um, what's safe, whether you would want to use a SEM bear range, like can you trust tags? Um, those are social decisions uh, and it's a great, great question to kind of bring into light. Um, Let's see, resources. Uh, thanks for anybody who has hopped off. I know we still have a ton of folks here, but lots of positive comments from people. Uh, any resources listing the best way for repo structure? Somebody actually uh, mentioned in the Slack channel, they have a document for their repo structure with some strong opinions about branching and things like that. Um, but I don't have it on hand. It was like GitOps standards. Yeah, unfortunately, I can't remember the, the person's name. Uh, we'll have to try and get that in a more central place. Uh, but I would recommend looking at some of our other series in the, the Power of GitOps uh, playlist inside of YouTube and um, looking at all the examples that we have. Uh, if you're looking for, the, there's a, 
a range of examples that serve from very simple uh, to like slightly more complicated like this one. Uh, if you check on my GitHub, uh, I have cluster API examples. I have uh, examples with CNI being bridged across multiple clusters. Uh, Stefan's published a bunch of things to so the Flux CD org. Uh, there's the multi-tenancy example, which uses the Caverno policy controller to restrict who can control what sources and that kind of thing in an experimental way. Uh, very cool stuff. Um, let's see, question about dependencies. Oh, that's a really good um, mention from Kingdon. If you want to vendor your depths using Helm, uh, you can use the Helm depth subcommand. Uh, good suggestion there. Uh, but source controller does fetch dependencies if you want to do it over the network. I would say that vendoring your your um, sources there is probably more reliable uh, because repos have moved around in the past. Uh, like, for example, when we had to change uh, the Helm 2 charts repository uh, recently. It's more efficient as well. Um, Max says, how efficient is using Git as technically a database for storing state? Uh, I would say that it's a huge win um, for persisting the state that you actually intend. See, the problem is that when you use Kubernetes and you actually apply, say, a deployment uh, or a policy to Kubernetes, that object gets committed to the cluster, but it's not preserved in the way that you applied it. It gets modified because other controllers are wanting to store their state or change values about those resources. Uh, and you lose comments and structure, fields get defaulted. Uh, so you know when API versions get updated, maybe you lose state and when the API server automatically upgrades your uh, API object. Um, and uh, there's a lot of gotchas. It, Kubernetes is not an effective storage mechanism for what you intend to configure about it. Uh, it is the place where the config ends up. And so you do need some place uh, to store your intended state. And Git is the perfect collaboration tool for that. Uh, because in addition to things like comments and non-defaulted fields being emitted from the YAML that we, you know, like we actually store what we care about in the order that we care about, in the form format that we care about inside of the Git repo. It might not even be YAML. We might be working with a tool set like that's a language above that. Uh, Git is the, is the right place for that. Uh, I wouldn't say that it's a database per se. Um, it is a version store. That's that's what we're looking to do. Um, but when you start, you know, uh, having complex tagging policies and things like that, uh, I wouldn't say that anything that we encourage doing in Flux hasn't already been done uh, in large open source projects and that kind of thing. Uh, Git grows pretty well to the scale that you're looking to use it for, uh, but it does have some rough edges in usability that are still improving. Um, hopefully that's a pretty succinct answer that addresses some of your concerns there. But um, if Git is not the right place for you, we don't necessarily force you to use Git. You can push your manifests to a bunch of buckets and version them however you want. Uh, or potentially in the future, we're looking at supporting OCI images. Uh, you don't need Git for GitOps, but it's a good way to do it. Uh, updating the values for Helm release, should that pod that is affected automatically restart uh, only if the values actually change the pod in the inflated helm release um, probably going to be harder to ex explain that if you uh, don't already see why that would be true um, but yeah changing a value doesn't necessarily change every object in a helm release uh, it might not even change anything at all uh, but uh, it would cause that Helm release to be reconciled. And we have a uh, note on the core concepts page about why that is. Um, lots of wonderful questions today. How to handle multi-tenancy? There's a great repo here. Check it out, Fluxity, Flux2 multi-tenancy. This is the developing area. We actually have a full proposal. Uh, if you go to um, Flux2 issues 582, um you can see a little bit of uh what we are looking at here there's also a discussion discussion 263 and flux cd issues 582 there are full proposals and some musings here about how to do multi-tenancy properly what we're looking at implementing in the future to make this even better uh, but if you want multi-tenancy right now with flux 
uh, you can use a policy controller like OPA Gatekeeper uh, or Caverno to kind of restrict the behavior of certain controllers and who can apply what objects. Uh, and that approach is documented here in Flux to multi-tenancy. Please try this out if you are a user that needs that kind of scale out of Flux already. It's exactly what it's built for. Um, awesome conversations here. Lots of folks helping people out. Um, people using a bunch of Spring Boots microservices with very similar manifest files. How would you structure your repo? Um, Bill, I would go look at the, um, at that Flux app demo, uh, repo and try to get an idea of how the application is being changed for different environments, uh, using the same base manifest structure using customize. So we use customize and the Flux customizations separately to do patches for different environments and then make sure that they get applied to different places. But that would also work for dev teams. Uh, you're also going to be interested in the multi-tenancy example. Um, Pedro, if you want to use dhaul with Flux, I would recommend doing it uh, in CI for the moment. Um, so I would have CI uh, do your dhaul builds into the JSON inside of the vendor directory. And then I would use Flux to apply the vendor directory using customized controller. Um, there's a possibility that you could build like a dhaul controller, uh, but that would probably be a lot of work. And um, we would need a community to maintain that. Uh, and you know, certainly if there are enough dhaul users, that's, that's the possibility. But uh, I think what you're really going to want, especially for uh, a non-standard templating or like construction config language like that, is the ability to see the differences uh, and so if you have CI or a make or pre-commit hook that's actually building those files and committing them to the vendor directory along with your other commits, uh, you'll be able to see those diffs inside of the PR reviews, but express your changes in dhaul, uh, which is a very good way of doing things. Uh, I know that requires a little bit of CI uh, knowledge, but I really think that's going to be more powerful for you, especially since it's a pretty non-standard tool set right now. Um... Yeah, Andreas also mentioned uh, talking about generating manifests uh, in the context of the Spring Boot apps also applies to dhaul and CDKs and JK and anything. Gosh, so many of you are still hanging around. Lots of awesome questions. I hope that today uh, has been an effective kind of primer for you in uh, like seeing how the core concepts uh, kind of work together, how they fit together. Uh, it's pretty clear to me that uh, many of you are also uh, joining from your platform teams or your um, your DevOps teams at your company or your organization, uh, and you have some pretty senior experience as well with working with Kubernetes and even Flux. Um, and I hope that the core concepts page, uh, as well as how to kind of reference our docs, how they uh, how the objects relate to each other, empowers you to not just use these things, but also teach your teams how to scale these initiatives because it's it, helping your teams work together, like establishing social norms uh, and getting folks to collaborate within Git uh, using a lot of these APIs and the way that they compose is what's gonna allow you to build the platform that you want. Uh, and we wanna build those examples. We wanna connect you together so that you can share ideas. Uh, go check out the Flux channel inside of the CNCF Slack. Open up GitHub discussions about the questions that you're asking. Uh, I see people are um, you know, feeling a little bit more convinced about Flux if you're a new user. Thanks so much for joining. Uh, next week, or, or sorry, not next week, uh, in the next talk, which is I believe February 8th, uh, we have an exciting overview of something that's been stopping us from having feature parity. Uh, I think that the way that this feature is getting built is very promising. Um, we are gonna be talking about image automation, how to automate updates to Git uh, so that you can collaborate with robots <laughs> uh, and and really improve your release flow based off of uh, how you're trusting that artifacts get tagged in other ways. Uh, the, we already have a guide for this. It's pretty, we're considering it alpha quality, but the design is looking very promising uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna dig into it. This will be more of an advanced session on the 8th, so yeah. Come join us. Also, lots of uh, lots of recordings on the YouTube channel for very non-trivial things like how to use Flux 2 with Cluster API, 
uh, how to do GPG signing, uh, dependency management, and health checks, all kinds of stuff. So uh, go check it out, share those resources uh, with your friends, with your teammates, uh, and let's let's all kind of help each other. Join the community channel, and uh, yeah, hand off to Stacy. You got any other closing notes? No, we are one minute past. So yeah, you did a great job wrapping up and thanks so much for that great presentation. And thanks everybody for all of the interaction, the answering questions, the questions in general. Um, and we'll see you on the 8th. Thank you. Yeah. You all are awesome. Thanks so much. <laughs> Reach out on the Slack channel. <laughs>